Good evening and welcome to tonight's debate with the Republican primary candidates running for U.S. Senate. I'm Glenn Mills and it is an honor to be moderating tonight's discussion sponsored by the Utah Debate Commission, an organization dedicated to educating voters and encouraging the civil exchange of ideas. The candidates tonight are John Curtis, Trent Staggs, Jason Walton, and Brad Wilson. If you are watching or listening live, you are welcome to send in your reactions and you can even ask some questions tonight on social media. All you have to do is use the hashtag UTDebates. The format for this debate is as follows. Each candidate will have a predetermined time to respond to the questions and on occasion there will be rebuttal time. A random drawing held prior to tonight's debate determining that uh, Mr. Trent Staggs will get the initial response to the first question. We will then alternate turns on the remaining questions throughout the night. Are you ready? It's time, candidates, to debate. And we do begin tonight with an opportunity to differentiate yourselves from the others on the stage with this question. As we mentioned, it'll go to you first, Mr. Staggs. What is it specifically about you that makes you the right candidate to represent Utah as its next U.S. Senator? Well, I think for far too long, we have just elected folks that have gone to D.C. and become part of the establishment. They haven't taken the chance to stand up to that establishment. I've done that time and time again, whether it's as my time as mayor or also in the way in which I've run this race. I'm the only one that challenged Mitt Romney. It was my stated goal to go ahead and primary Mitt Romney because I think he's endemic to the problem in D.C. of, again, putting people in there that just become part of the establishment, not standing up against it. And because of that, because of that fact, I believe I've gone on to win now the endorsement of the Republican Party. I won at convention with 70% of the vote. Now these are delegates, 4,000 of which were elected in your respective neighborhoods, have vetted all the candidates, and they've identified me as the best person, the person that is best suited to represent Utah. And I've also won the endorsements of Senator Rand Paul and President Donald J. Trump. I've got a coalition of national conservatives I can go back and work with day one that nobody else on the stage has. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stagg. We now turn to you, Mr. Walton. What makes you the best candidate for this position? Well, thank you. I'm grateful to be here tonight, but it's with a heavy heart as we see Joe Biden weaponize the government against our Republican nominee. Now to why I'm running. My opponents here on stage are gonna use the word experience a lot tonight. I've never run for office, but my experience is building a business in my garage with my wife and taking it national. My experience is balancing complex budgets and mentoring thousands in pursuit of their American dream. Now, I, my opponents talk experience, think this, spending too much, regulating too much, and basically doing things that are destructive to the American dream. Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Look, America is at a tipping point. I think we all feel it. And electing another career politician isn't the answer, they're the problem. I'm running for the United States Senate to save America. Just think, after the election, we'll have the White House again. We're gonna take back the Senate. This is our moment to restore American values, Utah values, to the United States of America. Okay, well, thank you. To wrap up, thank you so much for that. Mr. Wilson, the next minute is yours. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Utah, for tuning in tonight. I'm Brad Wilson, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate to do one thing to take the Utah way to Washington, D.C. and fix our country's greatest problems. You know, the Utah way is rooted in not just our faith and our belief in personal responsibility, but our conservative values as a culture. And Washington, D.C. needs that leadership more now than ever. You know, I'm a small business owner. I have been for 30 years. And I got into politics to make a difference and to get things done. And as Speaker of the House, I ushered in the largest tax cuts in the history of this state. I protected the sanctity of life through the most uh, proactive, strongest pro-life laws in the country, strengthened Second Amendment rights, and even sued Joe Biden to protect Utah's energy independence. In the U.S. Senate, I will close the border. I will balance the budget and I will do everything I can to bring back prosperity to the middle class of this state. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Curtis, the final response will be yours on this question. What makes you the best candidate for the job? Thank you, Glenn, and a, a shout out to the Debate Commission for putting this together and for my colleagues for being here tonight. I'm John Curtis. Many of you know me as the former businessman that had a manufacturing business in Provo where we built things made here in the United States. 
after successfully selling that business, um, I was looking for the next thing to get involved in. And the mayor of Provo had not been good to our business, so I decided to run for the mayor of Provo. Eight years later, Provo was ranked one of the best cities in the entire country for businesses. I had a 94% approval rating from my residents. We cut the city budget and had a fabulous experience. Well, well, many of you know, after that, I jumped into the third congressional district for where for the last seven years, I've been serving Utah in that great capacity. Recently ranked the ninth most effective Republican legislator in the House of Representatives. My office was ranked number one for constituent outreach and accessibility, things I'm very proud of. And tonight, during the debate, I helped to expand on those and tell you why I'm here to ask for your vote. Thank you, gentlemen, appreciate that. Turning now to the next question, a common theme we have seen come up over and over again in the narrative of this race is that of conservative. Uh, we've seen it in all the advertisements. We've seen some call for the need for a real conservative uh, to go to Washington on behalf of our state. So the question to you, Mr. Walton, first, is what does conservative mean to you and how do you fit the mold? That's a great question. So uh, conservative to me means that you really stand for the values and the Constitution. I think what a lot of people fail to realize and that we don't talk about enough is that the Constitution is the greatest piece of legislative governments that's ever been put forth in the history of the world. It's not a coincidence that shortly after the Constitution was enacted, the greatest civilization of the history of planet Earth sprang into existence. And it happened almost overnight, and it wasn't by accident. It's because the founding fathers who had suffered under tyranny understood that it was important that you have a vertical axis of federalism, keep the federal government small and reserve the sacred authority, all other authority to the states. And then they implemented the horizontal axis or the separation of powers, which the each branch of government needed to specifically have its own authority. We've strayed from that. We have not been sacredly maintaining the Constitution as George Washington admonished us to. To me, conservatism is the sacred maintenance of the Constitution. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilson, we'll turn to you. What does conservative mean to you and how do you fit the mold? Thank you for the question. And uh, as I've traveled across this state, I've heard one thing over and over again which is Utahns want a conservative fighter back in the U.S. Senate to fight for the values that we care about so much here. And, you know, you watch what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now with open borders, with out-of-control spending, with a lack of discipline and with a lack of getting things done. And none of those things are consistent with the values we have in this state and what we think conservatism means. Conservatism means spending the amount of money that you have, like we did in Utah. Not only did we balance our budget while I was Speaker of the House, but we had record tax cuts, providing tremendous prosperity. We now have the strongest economy in America because of the conservative principles that I helped lead while I was in office. And that's exactly the type of leadership that I intend to provide back in Washington, D.C., in the U.S. Senate. Thank you. Mr. Curtis, uh, what does conservative mean to you? People who don't know me well are often surprised when they see my voting record. I have people come up to me all the time and say, wow, I didn't realize your voting record was so conservative. I have the most conservative voting record of the House delegation. But what I think is even more important about this question is the acknowledgement that what's conservative in New York is not necessarily what's conservative in Utah. And even more so, what's conservative in San Juan County is not the same as Utah County. Conservative to me means representing the values of the people that you serve. And that can be very difficult because, as I mentioned, they vary from community to community. But overall, I think the voters have weighed in over and over that they like my brand of conservatism. And to me, that's Utah values. Mr. Staggs, the uh, final minute on this question is yours. Well, I think it's important that we have conservatives actually elected to represent us. Um, you know, it isn't conservative to add trillions and trillions of dollars to the debt ceiling. It is not conservative to continue adding trillions and trillions of dollars to the debt. Conservatism is limited government. That's what I've committed to. That's what I've done in my time as office of mayor. And it's what I'll do and take back to D.C. That's what I've heard over and over again is that Utahns want somebody who understands federalism, who understands that proper role of government, that the government closest to the people is what actually governs best, if government's to be involved at all. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution clearly delineates those things that we have given to the federal government. And if it's not there, frankly, it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be entertained or done at all by the federal government. It needs to come back to the states or to the people respectively. 
And we've got to have somebody that's going to do that, who's going to stand up to the cabal in Washington, D.C., and, and fight for conservative principles and not just add trillions and trillions to the debt. Okay, we do have a follow-up question we are going to ask, so we will go in the same order as the previous question. This comes from Carl Johnson on Facebook. And he asked, what are your thoughts about Donald Trump promising revenge and retribution should he become president? I Mr. think Walton. it's sad. Time yeah. is yours. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I think it's just sad for all of America to see how Donald Trump has been the most attacked and maligned, persecuted president or presidential candidate in the history of the United States of America. So as I said in the opening statement, I think it's just disheartening. This is a bipartisan issue, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, that the federal government is being weaponized by a current sitting U.S. president. I mean, look what they're doing to him. I mean, immediately, they tried to use the 25th Amendment against him. They've tried to, uh, as soon as he took office, uh, as, soon as, as soon as he took office, his first administration, we had Russiagate, which we know was a lie. They were trying to plant uh, spies, essentially, in his cabinet. Um, and then look what they're doing now. They're literally tying him up in court so that he can't campaign. And so I, I think that there's a lot of things that need to be investigated. I think a lot of the three-letter agencies that make me want to say the four-letter words, we need to look into them. We can't have a system in the United States government. It's a sad day when the current sitting president weaponizes the government against his political okay. opponents. We have to wrap it up on that note. Mr. Wilson, your response? You know, when I think about President Trump and him being the Republican nominee this year, I think it's important to understand why it's important we elect him this year. The middle class tax cuts, the tax cuts that he put in place a few years ago are set to expire. And Joe Biden has gone on record saying he wants those to expire. The middle class in the state of Utah cannot afford to let that happen. We need to close the border. We need to make sure we get spending under control in Washington, D.C. And we need to send a Republican from Utah who can set an example and can go back and work with the president to teach and to do the things that we've done here in Utah to all of Washington. Uh, there's such an opportunity here for us as a state. You know, regardless of how you feel about either of the nominees, the fact of the matter is, when you're a U.S. Senator from Utah, you're gonna go back and represent this state to the other branches of government. And it's important we elect people that have the experience and ability to go back and make a big difference. Mr. Curtis, your thoughts on the former president's comments? Right, I don't think, I think it's just human nature to feel the way that President Trump has expressed himself in that quote. But the reality of it is that President Trump is at his best when he's doing what he does very well. I think about him coming into the office and the work he'll do on the border. I think him coming into the office and the work that he'll do on re-upping the tax credits. I think of President Trump and his judicial nominations. I think of all the things, the deregulation and the other things that he did. And my guess is he'll have his pity moment, but then he'll come into office full of enthusiasm to do the things that this America country needs and is waiting for. Mr. Staggs, your response? Well, look, what has happened to President Trump is really, in my view, the greatest example of election interference and election fraud in our nation's history. I mean, here we have the political prosecution, persecution of a former president. If they can do that to him, they can do it to anybody. And this is just frightening. Uh, frankly, this is, I think, the biggest issue of our day. Um, it, it isn't climate change or some... Uh, something else. This is actually it, the weaponization of a judicial system against a political opponent. And that is what's going on here right now. And I'm happy to say that I endorsed President Trump last year, the first one in this race to do so. Um, and I, as I stated earlier, I've earned his total and complete endorsement. Uh, I know that there's some ambiguity as to whether uh, John Curtis has even endorsed President Trump, but I have, and I'll be able to go back there day one and work with President Trump like nobody else. Okay, um, since uh, John Curtis was mentioned specifically in that uh, response, I think we do need to have a 30-second uh, rebuttal on that. Um, as a rebuttal, though, each candidate also gets an, ad an additional 30 seconds. Uh, that those are the rules. Uh, so, Mr. Curtis, since you were uh, mentioned there, we will start with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm really the only one here tonight that's actually experienced working with Donald Trump. And uh, I think we can all ag agree that President Trump, uh, his degree of difficulty working with him could be high. But I'll tell you, I'm very proud in the way that I navigated my relationship with him when the three years that we served together. I, I was there when President Trump put the tax uh, reform proposal out and signed into law, and I was wind at his back. I was there part of the deregulation, and I was helpful to him with that. 
I was there for the Supreme Court nominations, and I was winded as back for those things as well. As a matter of fact, I'm the only one here in this group today that actually in 2020 went to other states and campaigned for President Donald Trump. Okay, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up on that note, Mr. Curtis. Uh, Mr. Walton, let's uh, skip to you. Thoughts on a potential relationship with the former president? You know, I look forward to working with him. I've always felt connected with President Trump because he's a businessman like me that wasn't in politics, was just frustrated watching what career politicians were doing. And he went in and he proved to the world that us businessmen are pretty good at getting stuff done in government because we don't have any political strings attached. We're not trying to get up the next stage of the political ladder. And I think that that's what this election's about. Also, President Trump is the person that America needs right now. He's the one who's going to go in and he's going to close the border, end catch and release, implement stay, stay in Mexico, and make America safe okay. again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilson? Thank you, Glenn. You know, there are really big problems in this country right now, and we've seen uh, what's happened under the Biden administration and his failed leadership, whether it's the open border, uh, whether it's a lack of regard for the law, whether it's the spending that's happened in Washington, D.C., and these tax cuts that are going to expire. And we have to send a strong conservative that's been in the fight like I have to go back and work with President Trump to make sure that these things get reversed and fixed so that the middle class and the people of all of this country, including those, of course, in Utah, feel like they've got their voice heard in Washington, D.C. Okay, uh, Mr. Sags, 30 more seconds on this matter. Well, I'll just note that we didn't get a response uh, there from, from John Curtis as to whether a simple yes or no if he endorsed uh, President Trump. I, I have. I came out strong last year, the first one to do it. And this is, what, this is what's lacking right now in Washington. We have far too many people that go back they want to tiptoe around. They don't want to be able to take a strong stand. You don't have that problem with me. I've taken on the establishment every single day. I'm going to go back and fight, and that's why I've got the support of so many great national conservatives. All right. We, I, I think he evoked so, another 30-second round. Well, let's not go another 30-second round, <laughs> but he, a, a, a yes or no quick response. Yeah, so let's get tied up in semantics, if you want. I've said I, su I would support the Republican nominee for president, and that's very simple. Yeah, let's, can, we, can we leave it at that? Sure. Thank you. Uh, we're going to turn now to a video question. This comes from Titan Daytona, a political science student from Southern Utah University. Hello, my name is Tyden, and I am a political science student at Southern Utah University, and here's my question. The Republican voters of Utah are becoming increasingly divided and factionalized. Subgroups of different ideologies have formed under the party, including moderates, traditional conservatives, libertarians, and others. What can you do in office to represent the diverse interests of your Republican constituents? All right, uh, Mr. Wilson, the first minute is yours. Yeah, thanks, Tyden. Uh, go Thunderbirds down in Cedar City. Uh, you know... It's very similar to what I did as Speaker of the House in the state of Utah. You know, people think oftentimes that having a supermajority of Republicans makes the job easy. But in fact, whether it was ushering the largest tax cuts we've talked about or strengthening Second Amendment rights or uh, even funding lawsuits against the Biden administration, you have to bring people along. And you have to understand where they're coming from and where they're working from. And I don't think there's anyone more well-suited on this stage to go back to Washington right now and listen to and work with people of very, very different opinions and try to bring consensus and a common goal and objective. That's the way we do things in Utah. That's the reason why we have the strongest economy in the country, the best place to operate a business. And the list goes on and on. And that's the type of leadership that I will bring as a U.S. Senator back in Washington. Mr. Curtis, that question goes now to you. The Utah's third congressional district that I've represented for the last seven years has some interesting contrast. If you go down to San Juan County, you'll find one of the most conservative counties in the United States, right next door is Grand County, and you'll find a very liberal, for lack of a better term, county right next door. I like to tease my friends in Grand County. Sometimes they, they hate that they like me because I do listen to them. I may have very different opinions than they do. I might vote differently than they would expect me to, but they have great respect for me and I have for them. If I were to list one of my superpowers back in Washington, D.C., and I think my colleagues would agree with me, it's my ability to work with people who have very diverse opinions from me and respect them and get things done without compromising my values or their values. This is what is among the most important things in Washington, D.C., people who, who disagree philosophically finding a path forward without compromising their values and it's what i'm very good at mr staggs well i think too often in political discourse we get talking about this group of people that group of people how are you going to represent all people you know what the america first agenda 
that I have committed to champion with President Trump and with a new Senate majority is, I think, something that helps all people. Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, an America First agenda, whether that's going ahead and stopping this crazy printing of money, which has caused the inflation and the Bidenomics that is crushing Utah families, and, and it's an extra ten to twelve thousand dollars a year that's now costing Utahns, Utah families. Uh, whether it's securing the border, that helps, I think, benefit everybody. It brings greater security to this nation. Whether it's regulatory reform, which I've committed to pass with Senator Mike Lee, the RAINS Act and stop all of this nonsense, this regulatory framework that's crushing businesses and taking a lot of our liberties with it. So an America First agenda is going to help out all Utahns, and I'm committed to pass that on day one. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Walton, you will wrap us up on this question. One minute. $34 trillion of debt. We have an open border where drug cartels are literally business partners with Joe Biden. There's record amounts of fentanyl and meth that are pouring into our nation. Fentanyl overdose is the leading cause of death for Americans between 18, between ages of 18 and 45, and the career politicians won't do anything about it. Look, that's why I got into this race. I was frustrated just like you as I've been talking to the people of Utah. I've sensed your frustration. Sometimes getting a path forward is code for spending. Sometimes building a coalition is code for spending. That's how we go from $34 trillion to $40 trillion and $45 trillion. We need to elect business people who there's no political strings attached to them, like me, who will go and stop the spending. Look, Mitch McConnell, as far as I can tell, when he's getting things done with Chuck Schumer, he's done a great job of passing the Democrat agenda. We need to get things done the conservative way, and we need to save America from going off a fiscal cliff. All right, thank you very much. Uh, interesting you bring up the federal debt because that'll lead right into our next question. As many of us look at that, it's an astronom uh, astronomical number that's even hard to comprehend. Experts have suggested there are a couple of ways of going about getting it uh, reduced. One would be to cut defense spending, Social Security, Medicare, and other entitlements, or the other option to increase taxes. Which of these options would you support when it comes to reversing that number? Mr. Curtis, the question is yours. Like, let me start with what I won't support, and that's increased taxes. Look, I've been back there for seven years, and I've had to tell presidents of both parties no on their budgets. Let's be honest, this is not a partisan problem. This is a bipartisan problem in spending. We're not going to make substantial changes until we deal with Social Security and Medicare the major portion of the budget that we don't even vote on. Right now, Social Security is not that hard. We could do a few simple things. Move the age of eligibility for those not near or at retirement, change the cap for, the, for where we stop taking out deductions, and tie the returns to the equity market instead of just bonds. Those three things alone are not hard to do, and that's what I'll continue to push forward in Washington, D.C. All right, Mr. Staggs, your thoughts on chipping away on that national debt? Like, this is the biggest reason why I've entered this race. I mean, my wife and I have a 14-year-old son and 12-year-old daughter, and I've said time and time again, it's the height of immorality to have people in Washington, D.C. that have raised that debt ceiling, that have voted trillions and trillions. They've added trillions of dollars to the debt just in the last few years. When I launched my candidacy May 23rd of last year, we were at $32 trillion in debt. We're now approaching $35 trillion in debt, $3 trillion in just one year. There are many ways that we can cut the budget. They're just not being entertained right now. I mean, Vivek Ramaswamy, who's endorsed my candidacy, put out an American Truth Pledge. And in there, he says and calls for a 75% reduction to federal employee headcount. 75%. There are several ways. We've got to get rid of the Department of Federal Education. That's $80 billion a year. Stop funding the UN at $20 billion a year. We have hundreds of thousands of personnel that are part of the DOD in a clerical nature that we could get rid of and have no impact to national security. And so there are several things that we can do to cut the deficit or cut the budget, and I'm prepared to go back and do that day one. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Walton, we'll go to you. Your thoughts on cutting the federal debt? Yeah, so we're saddling our children with, with generational debt, and it's, it, is, it, is a, it is a horrible thing to be doing. And it's also the reason why I, I got in the race. First, no, we're not going to raise taxes. Say that's part of the problem. Taxes and regulations are the things that are choking American business. And that, that, look, we're on the right side of the Laffer curve. And just simply put, that means that if we lower taxes, that the actual revenue that we, that we receive, the government receives from taxes is actually gonna go up. So we need to do that immediately. 
Other things we could do is let's stop the omnibus spending. Uh, let's stop all the earmarks. And the thing that I, I'm the most excited about serving in the United States Senate is we business people, we really like to tackle these kind of problems. I would love to go to every department and say, show me what it would look like if you cut 25% of your costs. And uh, this is something that I find that career politicians say one thing when they're running, and when they get in office, you find it's something else because career politicians are addicted to spending. It's not a good political move to do anything but talk about it. It's not listen to what people say, but watch what they do. Everything else is a lie. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, your uh, response for the next minute. You know, when I was thinking about running for this, I was actually talking with my wife, Jenny, about it. And, and she said, Brad, you need to run because this work matters and it really matters for our kids. And my children are all launching their lives right now in their early 20s. Their share of the national debt is over $100,000. If you want to look to how to do this, you just look to the Utah model where we're, we've unleashed the Utah economy. We've managed spending in remarkably disciplined ways. We know how to say no here. And we've created an economy that's given us not just the ability to have growth in revenues, but provide tax cuts over and over and over again. You know, if we want to get different results in Washington, if we want to get this spending under control and this national debt paid down. We need to send different people to Washington to make these changes that are so, so overdue. All right, uh, people across the country, even here in the state of Utah, really struggling with an increase, a dramatic increase in health care costs over the last couple of years. As a member of Congress, how would you work to cut down on the cost of health care for families that are really struggling with that? Uh, Mr. Staggs, we'll start with you. Well, it's, it's unfortunate that we haven't pursued more free market solutions in the healthcare industry and the healthcare space. Um, you know, it's one of the few uh, industries where you don't know, as a consumer, you really don't know the cost of any healthcare service that you're, you're trying to get until you're already there. And so we need to have transparency with respect to pricing of healthcare. Um, we need to be looking at what I've, I've been told is site neutral reimbursement in speaking with doctors. Uh, there is, in the Medicare uh, program, uh, program right now, there is a preference that's given to hospitals and, and actually reimbursing them at a much higher rate than, say, a private practice or a small clinic. Uh, just that one move would cut a tremendous amount. We need, we need tort reform. I mean, so many doctors I've talked to are actually prescribing procedures and tests that aren't really necessary, but it's a a means of covering themselves. And so a combination of all those things, I think would dramatically bring down the cost okay. of healthcare. Thank you. Mr. Walton, we'll turn to you. Your thoughts on uh, lowering the cost of healthcare. Well, we need to repeal Obamacare immediately. It's the worst piece of healthcare legislation passed in the history of the United States. It's just a giant, it's socialism, right? And we know that socialism, while sometimes it sounds good and kind, what it does is it increases costs substantively and it decreases the quality of service. I remember I was at one of my businesses when Obamacare was first introduced. It was, it was called the Affordable Health Care Act. And when the health care representative went over the health care costs, my employees were stymied because they're like, wait a minute, our health care costs just went up 35%. When does the Affordable Health Care Act come into, come into play? And I had to explain to them that was just a marketing tool. It wouldn't have worked very well if they called it your health care uh, costs of health care are going to double in the next two and a half years act. So they called it, they did what the left does so well, and they labeled it in a thing that was an intentional lie. But look, we need to return to free markets. Uh, when, we, when you have people competing in a free market, then prices go down and quality goes up. Less socialism. Mr. Wilson, your response? You know, the challenges that Utah families are facing with their health care costs are just a symptom of a greater problem we have in Washington. Washington right now is trying to do so many things that it has no right and no authority to do, whether it's uh, putting uh, Obamacare uh, on the top of the Utah and the, the U.S. economy, or whether it's all these other welfare programs that are strangling innovation. We have got so many opportunities to get government back in its lane. You know, I was a lawmaker. I passed a bill that said if you're going to be on welfare benefits in Utah, you actually have to pass a drug test. And then we said, on top of that, you've got to go out and apply for a job every week. Guess what? For that particular welfare program in Utah, recipients on that are on it half the national average. 
Again, some good examples of common sense Utah solutions to help people learn how to be personally responsible for themselves could really make a big difference in terms of the biggest problems we have in this country today. All right, uh, Mr. Curtis, your thoughts. I wanna start with a couple of 30,000 foot view ideas and then a couple into the weeds and hopefully have enough time. First of all, we have to change how we look at healthcare. We're paying people to take care of sick people instead of paying people to keep people well. That one change would be dramatic. The second is the way we view insurance. My father was an independent insurance agent and he taught me when I was a very young boy, insurance is for the things you can't afford to pay for. Yet today, many people wanna walk into the doctor's office and have insurance pay dollar number one. That's a huge mistake. The third thing is transparency. It's been mentioned that I totally agree with it. There has to be more transparency so consumers can make a better decision. Likewise, there has to be better education. You just try to figure out if you have a, a small surgery, what the cost is going to be at different locations and what the quality is going to be, it's near impossible to do. And I, I regret that I'm out of time, but I'll leave it right there. Okay, we actually do have a follow-up question to this coming in from social media. So we will go in the same order, starting with you, Mr. Staggs. This comes from Selka Van Dyke. Uh, this is something that has become an issue that has created quite a bit of debate across the country. And this question is, if elected, would you vote to protect access to IVF and birth control? Mr. Staggs, 30 seconds on this question. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. Protect IVF and birth control. Um, you know, that's, I don't think I need to even expand on it. Okay, sounds good. Mr. Walton? Yeah, so the federal government... Uh, needs to just be out of this issue completely. So one of the jobs that I have as a United States Senator, again, I want to repair the fracture in federalism. Federalism, again, is this concept that the federal government needs to be small and that the state government or authority, which is every imaginable authority, needs to be large, while the federal authority is very specific, very enumerated, and none of that has to do with birth control. The founding fathers understood that the more important something was, the more personal it was, it needed to be handled at the local, the state levels. Okay. Let's return to federalism. Mr. Wilson. Well, um, I don't think you're actually supposed to do this in debates and completely agree with one of your opponents, but everything Jason said, I actually agree with. I mean, I had a front row seat as Speaker of the House over and over again. We watched the federal government try to wade into issues that we could so much more effectively deal with here in the state of Utah. And you have to ask Mother May I from Medicaid and these other programs all the time to do things more efficiently, to get more access and more benefits to the people of this state. And it's just a great example of how the federal government is doing so many things it should not, including regulating this. Mr. Curtis? IVF is an e easy answer, yes. As a matter of fact, I don't know anyone in Washington who doesn't feel the same way, and to suggest otherwise, I think, is just a scare tactic. On contraceptives and birth control, you have to get into the weeds a little bit. We just saw in the Senate a bill that had a lot of poison pills. For instance, part of that bill that they were asked to vote on required companies to provide contraceptives. And the line between birth control, contraceptives, and abortion sometimes grows very thin. And I would need a whole lot more details before I was willing to commit on that. Okay, let's move on to immigration. It's a topic we've heard Congress and former presidents talking about now for decades. It's also something the American people have heard the same song and dance over, over, and over again, and have not seen much action there. So let's talk tonight about specific ways to address this issue. We, of course, saw a uh, bipartisan bill go down earlier in the year. So talk about how we address this um, situation with immigration and then also uh, what your specific ideas you would really do, real tangible things you could get done. Mr. Walton, we'll start with you. Well, thanks, it's really simple. Joe Biden is business partners with the Mexican drug cartels, plain and simple. And think about it, what Joe Biden's getting is over three million illegal immigrants who are coming to the, into the America each year who he and the Democrats presume are gonna vote Democrat. And what the cartels are getting is more than a 20-fold increase in human trafficking revenue and a 20-fold increase in, in the fentanyl uh, and meth and heroin, drug trafficking revenue. It's not right. And at what cost? This political, sick political trade is costing tens of thousands of Americans' lives. Donald Trump had it right, and he'll solve this day one. End the catch and release policy. Implement the stay in Mexico policy. And then, so for the people, the stay in Mexico policy means that when illegal immigrants come and they give their cockamamie uh, excuse as to why they need asylum, and over 95% of them are rejected. They should just be re remaining in Mexico instead of right now 
where they welcome them in, give them a phone, a plane ticket, some money, and then a plane ticket near you, right here in Utah. It's not right. We're gonna have to end on that note. Uh, Mr. Wilson, the same question to you. Give us some real solutions to the immigration issue. You bet. When Joe Biden became president with over 90 executive orders, he opened up the border. We've had tens plus million of illegal immigrants flood into this country, creating a humanitarian crisis and a security crisis that we are all aware of. It's very simple. Uh, the border needs to be closed. Uh, we do need to reinstate the Remain in Mexico policy. And uh, I do think we need to finish building the wall. You know, a few years ago, uh, John Curtis said that building the wall was pent up racism. I don't believe that's the case. I think building the wall is like having a good fence with a good neighbor. It makes you good neighbors. These are all things that are important in terms of our ability uh, to manage our border instead of turning it over to the drug cartels and foreign nationals and other countries that are trying to destroy the United States of America. All right, Mr. Curtis. To clarify, that's a minute 30. Well, let's go with a minute right now, and then if we need more time after that, we will right. look into that. But since it comes after you, I'd like to try to wrap it up in the minute if we can. Sure. Uh, listen, nothing in the United States Senate or Congress is going to happen until we secure the border. That's very clear. And it's also very clear Joe Biden could do this tomorrow if he wanted. All he'd need to do is reinstate, remain in Mexico. If you look at what Republicans produced in the House in H.R. 2, that's a recipe for everything, our whole wish list, which I supported, and we've got to figure out a way to get that into law. Now, you asked for some specifics, and I'd like to give some specifics that nobody else has even tried to touch on. How would we fix this? I have a bill. It's called a state-sponsored visa bill. It would actually give visas to governors around the United States that were separate from the federal visas that they managed themselves. They would be responsible for monitoring people that came into the state and how these visas were used. It's a good bill. It's bipartisan and has a real chance of progress. The other bill that I have removes ca uh, country caps. If you get down into the weeds, you'll see that India has more people that could want to come to this country than Sweden. By removing those caps, we could make that happen. Now, give me just a minute to respond to Mr. Wilson. I'll give you 30 seconds, and then it'll everyone take else less, will get it'll take less some, than that. some of that time as well. Listen, uh, Brad, if the best criticism you can come up with me is a segment from an interview that happened seven years ago out of context, then I'm feeling pretty good about that. I may have said that. I don't know what it was because it was out of context and clearly doesn't represent my seven years of work in Congress. Mr. Stanks. This is a huge issue. I mean, as I've traveled the state for over a year now, border, budget, regulatory reform. These are the top three. And the border, the so-called bipartisan bill, it was not, uh, I, I think, anything but. I mean, here we have President Biden who has created this problem. He undid so much of what was successfully implemented by President Trump. He and Secretary Mayorkas, uh, I, I, who should have been impeached a long time ago, he is wholly incompetent. I think it's actually by design. We've had 10 to 12 million people invade this country during the Biden administration. And I remind folks, this is three times the population of our state. It's massive when you put it into that context. The solution is simple. Build the border wall, remain in Mexico, e-verify, and cutting off any benefits to illegal immigrants. When you do that, they will largely self-deport, I believe, and the problem will start to correct itself. But this is a massive problem that has several, several consequences across many communities, including my own. All right, thank you very much, appreciate that. We are now going to uh, move on to another topic, and that being the bills that uh, come before you in Congress. Uh, some joke about it, but it is a real issue that you may not even have time to read through all of it before you end up voting on it. So the question is, when you take a look at these large, massive bills, and you're able to agree with most of it, but not all of it, will you still vote for it as a compromise measure, and where do you uh, end up drawing the line on that? Mr. Wilson, the first response is yours. Yeah. I appreciate it. Well, I think we all know that the process and systems in Washington, D.C. are fundamentally broken. And uh, first and foremost, I would say that I would never, as a U.S. Senator, vote for an omnibus spending bill that I didn't have time to review that was creating all kinds of havoc with the national debt and our deficit. But it goes deeper than that. 
Um, we've got to follow the models that we used to have in Washington and the models that we even have in Utah where you have bills that are on single subjects instead of these bills that have all kinds of things piled in them that create this problem. The reason that the leadership in Washington has so much power right now is the members have allowed them to run Congress in a way that we would never run the state of Utah. And you, you create kind of leverage and you give all this power to a select few back in Washington. And that's the reason that our country is in the mess that it's in. And I would never support that kind of lawmaking. It's not the Utah way, and it's not the way we're going to ever fix this country. Mr. Curtis, when you have a bill that you agree with most of, but not all of it, what path do you take and where do you draw the line? You know, this is actually a really good opportunity to talk about the process of bills in Washington, D.C. And people at home might be surprised to know in the House of Representatives, there's been days where I have literally had 200 votes. Uh, there's been days, as been as alluded to, where I receive a 6,000-page bill in the middle of the night and I'm expected to vote on it the next morning. Those are easy no's. What's harder are good bills that have a lot of good in it, but some bad. And I'll give you a good example of one vote that I took years ago that still kind of keeps me up awake at night is violence against women. I voted against that bill, and I still feel bad about that. But in, tucked into that bill was a provision that said any man could walk in and claim access to those funds by simply saying they identify as a woman. That, for me, was a deal breaker. So the answer to your question is you really have to take these one at a time. How bad is the poison pill? How good is, are the things that you would like to accomplish? Those things balance out. And there's rarely a bill that we vote on that doesn't have some of both. Mr. Stanks. This is one of the biggest problems in Washington today is you've got what Mike Lee has affectionately termed the firm. You've got Senate and House leadership that go into a back room, cobble together thousand page plus pieces of legislation and budget and throw it on the desks of members of Congress. I have been vehemently opposed to Mitch McConnell. And I said from months and months ago that I would not support him. I'm a quick no vote for him to be the next Senate Majority Leader. Now, since that time, he's said that he isn't willing or doesn't want to seek a leadership post. But I was completely opposed because he is enabling that process to continue. And that is why we're $35 trillion in debt. It's these omnibus spending bills. And I have committed, I have a contract with Utah where I've committed to balance the budget and also to never vote for an omnibus spending bill, a continuing resolution, because that's the problem. We have got to get back to process. And until we do away with the firm, and we're able to actually look at the budget as 12 appropriations subcommittee bills, we're never going to get there, which we haven't had a balanced budget since 2001. Mr. Walton, your response? Well, I don't understand why all Americans, Republican and Democrat, aren't talking about this and making it the number one issue. You have Chuck Sch Schumer, the Democrat leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, basically getting together in the dark of the night and passing, putting together legislation then they'll send it to the other senators at 11 or 12 at night, I've seen it myself, and expect for a vote the next in the morning. That's tyranny in the Senate. It's giving the American people the illusion that you have 100 senators when really it's just two people doing it in a dark room at night. It isn't right. This is something that all of us need to stand up and rise up and stand together. Why does, don't people talk about this more? You don't hear it from career politicians because they're afraid because they're afraid because those Senate leaders control giant funds and they use those funds during times of election. And so, sure, people will talk about them. How many people running for the United States Senate nationwide were running radio and TV ads against Mitch, Mitch McConnell exposing this? I'm the only one that I know of. And the reason I did that is I'm trying to say to Utah, everyone says they're going to go take on the establishment and big government, but they'll whisper about it behind closed doors. I tried to show the people of Utah and the United States of America, this is what it means to take on the establishment. Do it publicly. And the same way that I've done it publicly in this campaign, in the way that no one else would, I will do the same thing in Washington, D.C. You're going to love it. All right. I do want to uh, let you all know we're about five minutes away from closing uh, statements. Uh, we do have an online question that came in from Nathan Sutterfield. And his question is, with uh, Utah being one of the best places in the country to both live and start a business, and uh, growth rates really reflecting that. What is your strategy for helping manage and future uh, proof our water usage? And the first one for this is Mr. Curtis. The Utah Constitution is clear that Utah feels like the water in the state of Utah is theirs, and I absolutely agree with that. That means the federal role is to support the state and let the state come to the federal government for the resources they need. 
there are a couple of really important bills that I've worked on from a federal perspective to help the state. One is, people don't realize this, but the salinity in the Colorado River is actually very high. And I've got a bill that doesn't increase the federal budget that, that actually works to take that out so we have more water. I also have a bill that, but let's just admit, our conservation districts in Utah do a fabulous job. But people want to tax incentives that they give to people to save water. So my bill would make sure that those were non-taxable. Just a couple of examples of the federal role. The last thing I would mention is clearly more infrastructure is needed. As the st state dictates what is needed, I stand ready to bring those resources to the state so that we can do what we need to do to grow the state with the water that we have. Mr. Staggs, talk about the future of water in our state. Hey, incredibly important. I mean, here in Utah, we're the second most arid state in the country. Um, everybody understands that. I mean, as a mayor, uh, we've, we've experienced that. And this is a state's rights issue. This is something that the state needs to be able to control. But sadly, the federal government is in the way. And we haven't seen really much help at all uh, with respect to the EPA and other three-letter agencies that are constantly in the way of a state being able to dic dictate its own future with respect to water use. I know in our own state we wanted to build several dams, which the EPA and federal government, through regulation, have stepped in and stopped that from happening. And when we've had years of plenty like we have this last year or two with good rainfall, good snowfall totals, we should have been able to hold that back more so in our own reservoirs. But instead, we are challenged because the federal government is in the way. That's what I want to do is get back there and actually take a chainsaw to regulatory agencies because they are far too intrusive and need to be get, need, we need to get them completely out of the way. Mr. Walton? So the question is how much water do the people of Utah deserve? And the answer is a lot. Water should follow the people, right? So Californians are flowing into Utah in record numbers and the Utah, and the water should follow them with them. Want more water rights to Utah. Listen, there's over 360 billion to 1.6 trillion gallons of water that the Californians are just allowing to wash and dump in the ocean as they save some little fish. That's literally between one third to one half of, the, of all the water that's in Lake Powell at any one given time. It's ridiculous. And then they want to come get more of our water. Look, the Colorado River Compact, is expect, it, it expires in 2026. It's going to be reevaluated. With me in D.C., I, I'm going to be all over that. I'm going to negotiate it and make sure the water gets to where it belongs. And that's right here in Utah. All right, Mr. Wilson, the final minute on this question is yours. I love this question. We actually don't get it a lot. And water is one of the most important issues facing the future of the state of Utah. And no one on this stage tonight has spent as much time working on water as I did. As Speaker of the House, it was my biggest priority. And I understand water from the top of this state to the bottom in very, very intricate and deep ways. And Speakers of the House don't run legislation. But I actually ran a bill creating the Colorado River Authority for the state of Utah because California and lower basin states are trying to take our water, are trying to steal our water. And I said, enough is enough. We're not going to stand for that. So we created the Colorado River Authority, and now we've gone from having one arm tied behind our back in the negotiations that are literally happening today. And now we are leading those discussions, protecting Utah's water and fighting for Utah's future. And that's the kind of leadership and kind of experience and kind of deep understanding of this issue that I intend to take back to Washington, D.C. Thank you, gentlemen. We have about 30 seconds left before we get to closing statements. So we're just going to do a quick uh, rapid fire round. This would be a quick answer, yes or no. First one being, how long would you serve if elected in this seat? How many terms? Stag, uh, Mr. Staggs. Two. I've signed the term limit pledge. Okay. Mr. Walton? Yeah, two. We get that balanced budget amendment. Mr. I've Wal signed the term limits pledge for two terms as well. Term yeah, I think we have to admit that the road to Congress is littered with bodies that have signed pledges. I would point to my past. I was eight years mayor of Provo, seven years in the House. People don't have to worry about me staying too long. Okay, next one comes from Danny Johnson. Will you accept the results of this year's elections across the board, yes or no, Mr. Walton? It's a loaded question, but yeah, yeah, of course, I'm going to accept the the uh, I'm going to accept it, and I look forward to serving with President Trump in the United States Senate. Mr. Wilson, no, not if we see there's proven fraud and we know there's fraud, I won't accept the results. But I have confidence in our elections in the state of Utah. Uh, we've got great elections officers Mr. here. Mr. Curtis, yeah, I have to remind people elections are a state issue, not a federal issue. 
constitutional responsibility is to accept the results the state send you, and yes, I will accept Mr. those. Mr. Sachs, it, it really is something that we have to take a look at. I mean, we saw so many evidences of fraud in this last election. We saw big tech get together and censor free speech with respect to Hunter Hunter Biden's laptop, for example, that would have um, would have had. We're running influence. out of time, and we have to get to uh, closing statements now. So we have reached the end of the debate. Random drawing held earlier did determine that the first closing statement would go to Mr. Walton. Mr. Walton, the time is yours <laughs> for one minute. Thank you. I've been mentoring young people here in the state of Utah for over 25 years, and uh, I can tell you what, they are hardworking, they're smart, and they're going to be the ones who save us. So. They also realize that it's career politicians that are saddling them with debt. It's wrong, it's insanity, and the kids, they know it. Now, when I talk to members of the baby boom generation, they sit around worrying about what's gonna happen when they turn over the government to the rising generation. But I'll tell you what, I've been working shoulder to shoulder with the young people, and they really will be our salvation. Listen, it is, it is our generation that's been spending America into bankruptcy, it's our generation that can't figure out whether someone's a man or a woman, and it's our generation that has spent Social Security dry, and the kids know it. So it's time for us to start living worthy of them, live within our means, return to our founding values, our Judeo-Christian values. We need to give the kids a chance. Okay, we'll I ask for it on that note. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilson, you're up next for one minute. Thank you, Glenn, and thanks for everyone for participating tonight. I want to thank my wife, Jenny, uh, my three kids, and my son-in-law for supporting this adventure that we've been on. Uh, I love the state of Utah, and there's nothing that I care more about than taking the Utah way of small government and low taxes back to Washington, D.C., and teaching that dumpster fire of a city how to get things done and how to manage government in the right way. We've got an incredible opportunity to send someone back to Washington that represents our values, that has the right experience to get things done, that knows how to work well with people. That's what I did as Speaker of the House, and that's what I intend to do back in Washington to represent this state honorably in a conservative way that's going to help get our country back on track. Thank you very much. Mr. Curtis, one minute. The state's in the midst of a very important decision, and I get it. It's hard. How do you know who's telling you the truth? How do you know who can actually keep their promises? The one thing about John Curtis is you know exactly what you're going to get. People know who I am and they know what I stand for. This is the only job I've ever applied for where experience is suggested to be a bad thing. So as you're making your decision, there's several things I think it's important for you to consider. One, you may not know this, I actually bring my seniority from the House into the Senate, which means Utah's not starting over with a brand new freshman in the Senate. Two, I'm the only one that stood up to China I like to joke and people know there's a warrant for my arrest in China because I've been so aggressive in pushing back on their trying to subjugate the United States to them. Three, I'm the only person that has said no to both presidents spending plans when they overspend. Four, fifth, public lands. I've transferred more public lands from the federal government to the state than anyone's in the state's history. And lastly, I've done more for energy independence and dominance in this country than anyone else in Congress. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Staggs, you have the final minute. You know, on March 4th of 2020, Abbott Laboratories was awarded a federal grant. On that same day, John Curtis purchased stock in that company. This is the problem in Congress. At a time when somebody should be looking out for their constituents, they end up looking out for their own profit. That's why I've signed a contract with Utah I want to ban the trading of individual stocks for members of Congress and their families. I want to also stop members of Congress from retiring and becoming lobbyists and enriching themselves further. This is the problem that we have. And you know what? I've stood up to the establishment time and time again. I've done it throughout my entire career as I challenge Mitt Romney, willing to primary him in this election. I've now received the endorsements of so many national conservatives to include Senator Rand Paul, and also President Trump. I have that coalition of people I can go back and work with day one that will go ahead and represent Utah and further its interests more than anybody else here on their stage. We will have to wrap it up on that note. I'm sorry we are out of time. To respond to that. Real quick, as fast as possible. Yeah, Trent, that is such a low shot. You wait till I have no response. You throw something out I can't respond to. You've accused me of a felony here tonight 
you better have very good evidence and i'd like to challenge you to produce that evidence that somehow i've committed hey. a felony and if that's how you're going to work in senate the people of utah would be very disappointed gentlemen we are out of time uh thank you so much uh for this conversation tonight appreciate uh, all of you and your dedication to public service election day remember is tuesday june 25th make sure to contact your county clerk if you have any questions about making your vote count in this election we greatly appreciate pbs utah for donating the production facilities to broadcast this debate here tonight. We are also grateful for the Larry H. and Gail Miller Family Foundation, Zions Bank, the George S. Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation, and the Stewart Family Foundation for their generous support. Thanks so much for joining us, and have a great night.